on your radio, on Global Player, and play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock, the Prime Minister has been fined for breaking coronavirus rules but says he won't be resigning. He says he's paid the punishment for being at what he's called a brief gathering on his birthday in June 2020. Lasting for less than 10 minutes, during which people I work with kindly passed on uh, their good wishes. And I have to say, in all frankness, at that time, it did not occur to me uh, that this might have been a breach of the rules. His wife Carrie has also paid a fine while the Chancellor is getting one too. The Labour leader thinks the Prime Minister and Rishi Sunak should both resign. Sir Keir Starmer believes it's the first time in the history of our country that a sitting Prime Minister has been found to be in breach of the law. The Lib Dems want Parliament to be recalled for a vote of no confidence. Officers in New York say they're not treating a shooting at a subway station as a terrorist incident. Ten people were shot in Brooklyn with six more suffering other injuries. Detectives are looking for a suspect. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed down 41 points at 75.76. The pound buys $1.30 and €1.20. And LBC weather. Rain continuing to push northwards across Scotland tonight. Drier further south with the odd spot of rain in the west. Lows tonight at 5 degrees. A mixture of sunny spells and showers tomorrow. Feeling quite warm with a high of 18 degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Simon English. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening. It's one minute past eight on LBC. I'm Ian Dale. Today is Tuesday. It's Tuesday's Cross Question and lots to talk about over the next hour. In the studio with me on the panel, we have Philip Blonde, former advisor to David Cameron and a director of the Respublica Think Tank. Andrew Harrop is General Secretary of the Fabian Society. Dr Alan Mendoza is Executive Director of the Henry Jackson Society. I called you the three wonks earlier. I hope you're not going to be offended by that. And a very unwonkish Zoe Williams, columnist for The Guardian. They're here to take your calls. 0345 6060 973. It's always a good sign when there's almost a full switchboard right from the get-go. One space left. And you can watch us on Global Player 2. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question. With Ian Dale. This is LBC. Well, welcome to you all. Let's get going with Simon in Orpington. Hello, Simon. Hi, good evening, Ian, and thank you for taking my call and my question. Uh, my question is quite simple and quite short. Um, basically, how many fines is too many fines before Boris Johnson does the right thing and resigns? Well, he's had one today. Do you think he's going to get more then? Oh, uh, yes, I do suspect this, yes. Yeah, Philip do. Blonde. Look, I, I don't think he should resign because I don't think anybody should resign for getting what's the, a fixed penalty notice. If any of my staff got fixed penalty notice, I wouldn't ask them to terminate well, not prime their minister. jobs. No, but the point is, is I think it, it applies. I mean, you know, when cabinet ministers get, as Harriet Harman did get, pe penalties for driving, for using their phones, people don't ask them to resign. No, but, I think, but he brought in these laws himself. They were sure. lockdown laws which he brought in and the argument that lawbreakers cannot be lawmakers surely is quite a winning one. Um, I think that you can, you can bring in laws and, and um, violate them uh, <laughs> at, at, in the way that the police As think he did. As a prime minister. I don't think it's a resigning matter. I think it's trivial compared to what's happening in the world. I think it's trivial compared to his role uh, in in the fact of being Ukraine's probably greatest ally at, at its moment of urgent need. And I think it's unreasonable to ask him to resign. I also think... Even though he's clearly broken the ministerial code. Well, even though I think that um, he himself perhaps believed he didn't uh, I can believe that he didn't feel he, he broke the rules. In Downing Street, it's a very intense atmosphere. He walked from one room where he's working with people into another room where he's also 
the people he's worked with, I can see how those mistakes took place. I think that very few... And if, you, I, I and think if he had whole... stood up in the House of Commons last December, bear in mind this happened yeah. the previous June, if he'd stood up in the House of Commons and said, look, yeah, there was this one event, and in retrospect, I realised that I should have either called it off or walked out of the room, or whatever. But he didn't do that. He, he sort of doubled down, didn't he? Well, I think that's his nature. He's not a man of detail. So, so and that's I, OK, and I think, then, just because it's his nature. I'm not saying it's OK. I'm not saying it's OK. I just don't think it's the level to be a resigning okay. matter. Right. I think it's relatively trivial. I think that compared... I wouldn't ask anybody to resign. I actually think there should be an amnesty about all fines. I think they were extreme and unwarranted. Well, that's a, that, that's a no, different but, argument. But, no, but, you okay, know, I no, I get I'm, that. I'm against right. this all. Andrew, I can tell you're, you're sort of itching to get in on the conversation. <laughs> I think you have to remember the really extraordinary moment we were in as a nation. And he had set the rules that placed that huge, those huge restrictions on us. And we've heard today that he wasn't following them himself. This is one incident, and we there are likely to be others, perhaps who will receive more fines. And to say, as Philip is, that, you know, we should just set this aside, given the sacrifice that millions of people in this country were making, he was asking us to make, and he didn't make them himself. On top of that, he's quite clearly misled Parliament. You know, the, the reassurances he gave the House um, last autumn, you know, have been shown today to be complete well, he rubbish. Said, he, he said, resign. I have been reassured that no rules were broken. Now, is that could be a bit of a get-out for him, because he said, well, I, I didn't deliberately tell uh, an untruth. I was assured by my civil servants or whoever that no rules have been broken. If this was about one ten-minute birthday tea, you might be right, but we know that this goes so much further. It was dozens of incidents, many involving him personally, and it was the culture of Downing Street that he led. You know, he was at the top, he has to take the can for the the rottenness of this institution at this moment of national crisis. What do you say to the argument that um, we we are in the middle of, I mean, we're not at war, but we kind of are in, in, a, in a sense. President Zelensky clearly sees Boris Johnson as his main ally. Um, I mean, Putin would be laughing all over his face, wouldn't he, if Boris Johnson was forced out? The United Kingdom has changed prime ministers at moments of crisis before the Second World War being a case in point. But actually, I think it's about strong leadership and ability to do the job. This is now a massive distraction for Boris Johnson. There's no coming back from this in terms of his, his trust with the nation, his credibility as a leader. It would be far better for both him, and I shouldn't give advice to the Conservative Party as someone of the left, but for his party, to do it quickly think and get rid of <laughs> get get rid of get rid of the man quickly. He can't come back from this. Right, let's have a very dispassionate point of view from Guardian columnist Zoe, Zoe Williams. Well, if you're expecting me to thump the table, <laughs> you can think again. I mean, look, the, the thing is, Philip, you say that he's the, the matter is trivial compared to the role. The man is trivial compared to the role. He does not belong in the role of Prime Minister. You cannot repeatedly lie and then say, oh, it wasn't a lie because I don't know anything. I don't know what a party is. I don't know what was going on. I don't know what was happening in this place where I live and work. Now, the man has been absolutely immature and ridiculous for the whole that his behaviour in Downing Street, you must have read the story about when he actually had COVID and they were trying to encourage him to sit in his own office without anybody else around so he didn't in infect them. They had to put chairs across the door because he's like a toddler. He can't stay in one place, even if he's going to pass on a potentially fatal disease. So this idea, you know, he's such a statesman that we can't possibly lose him at this time of crisis. I've never heard anything so ridiculous well, in my life. Uh, on Ukraine, though, I think it's fair to say that he has led this country well, the very well during this The bad news for you, Ian, is that I've already had this argument four times this week. Now, he does very well posturing and peacocking. He does very well with kind of military toys. He does not do well on the grim business of government, which is getting refugees to a place of safety. And 
Zelensky is very tactful and he does appreciate the comradeship and the solidarity. But if he were being honest, and I'm sure when he's being honest later, further down the line, he will say it would have been much more useful for the UK to actually take in a timely and competent fashion the many, many people who had families. Well, we can all here. agree on that. But the fact well, no, is, but don't, fact don't is, we can all agree on that? Well, we, we cannot can, stand we can here and say, look, he's Zelensky's main but, ally. When Zelensky's well, he is because main he has provided military met. hardware to Ukraine in a way that other countries have failed to do. And Zelensky himself has said that without the help of the United Kingdom, they wouldn't have been able to push back the Russians in the way that they well, have. Well, certainly geopolitically, Zelensky has to be all positive towards Johnson and no negative. I mean, certainly that, because he needs to use that as a pressure point to put... Well, he did invite Boris Johnson to yeah, yeah, Kiev, didn't yeah, yeah, he? No, I'm not and at all he's disinvited saying, not, the German I'm, president I'm, today. In no way. Obviously, the, the beef with the Germans is as much to do with their deficient sanctions as it is to do with the actual See, I think it is hardware. possible, as I did yesterday, to say that I was actually proud that a British Prime Minister went to Kiev for the well, weekend. Well, it's possible for say, you to say it, but it's not mandatory for me to say it. It's not mandatory to say it at all, but I, I think if... I think it's perfectly possible to say he did well on that, but he's not done well on this. Sure, it's perfectly possible to do both those things if you're minded to do so. What I'm saying is the idea <laughs> just that he's... Slag him off over then, well, well, come on, the, the, this, this man is bringing our entire political culture into disrepute, and it's not just him. And Rishi Sunak lied about his wife's tax affairs, was caught in the lie, lied again, was caught in that lie. This is a culture of impunity and dishonesty and it's how did rishi sunak lie well, so he came out and he said this is nothing to do with her actual tax affairs this is purely to do with her nationality and then a load of tax experts said no it isn't that and you know it so then he came out and said this has been this has been extant for an awfully long time and it's nothing to do with how much she pays and then a load of tax experts said it actually is to do with how much okay. she pays and it's nothing to do with caring for her parents in their later years so you know you have very very senior members of government just being untruthful, which, it, you know, the backstop is they're not allowed to lie in Parliament. If we let them lie in Parliament, that's a really serious shift. OK, Alan Mendoza. I don't think Boris lied in Parliament. I think there is so much confusion about the rules. I know you're going to say, well, he set the rules. Actually, the rules are unclear. We all knew that you know, they changed at various points. Was there business meetings? Were they not? These kind of bizarre decisions. I think what you pointed out, Ian, was quite right, that he had got an assurance somewhere along and he hadn't broken the rules. The police felt differently. I don't think you can go from that to say he deliberately lied in Parliament. Look, clearly he knew where he was and where he wasn't. That's obvious. I think it is right <laughs> to point out what Philip had said earlier. Downing Street during the crisis was unlike many other places during the crisis. It was a normal place of work. Now, very few other places had that in the same way. And as a result, understanding the difference between a normal place of work and segueing into other things is, is difficult. There's no doubt about it. Am I now, allowed to ask a question? Well, can I just... Let, let's finish, finish first. first. You had a and good then bash. by all means you can. Um, look, and from that point of view, because of that difference of nature, I think you've got to go... This is an unusual situation. The police have felt you've done something wrong. You have apologised. We understand that you're going to have to keep on apologising quite clearly. The idea the Prime Minister is going to resign over this, though, is for the birds. I just don't yeah. think it's going to happen. And and don't think MPs are going to allow that either. Well, it would, no actually, it would actually take some honour from him for, his, for him to resign, so I don't think he will either. But my question no is, you say it was a no very, Prime very... Would do that you there. say it was... A, well, no Prime Minister would behave like this, but moving on, you say this was a very unusual workplace in the sense that they were still working. Yeah. Well, tell that to all the schools and all the hospitals, the vast majority of public services you know there were lots and lots of offices Correct. still work, working who did not behave did not use their workplace as some kind of social event who weren't mm. getting suitcases full of alcohol and this idea that you know it was a perfectly fair mistake and how could he possibly have known it was a party if that stood up at all then the metropolitan police would not have fined him no, I think the Metropolitan Police were in a in a situation where they were they were quite willing not to take action quite clearly until well, yeah, exactly. it became, but they were quite willing not to until the pressure was on them to do that. We all knew the the police would have known what was going on. The idea they could have walked in to this sort of thing, the police sitting outside didn't know what was going it's on. Like you want to take the police with them? I I, <laughs> I can quite easily see how how the Prime Minister sincerely believed he didn't break any rules. I've had conversations with him where he's 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 told me that quite expressly and I can see that he believed it. Now, what happened is the police came in and said, no, you didn't. So, 
that's that can happen. I still think it remains that this is well, the a trick. Said yes, he did. Yes, and, and he said yes, he did. But that means he you, he can he didn't lie to Parliament if he, in good faith, believed he didn't break the rules. And he said that to me, and I I believe him. So is that his get out then? Do you think? Well, I think it's a le- look. I think it's a legitimate. Think of those two people who went wandering on, on on the moors and then they had the police helicopters and some insane... And they said, I don't believe we're breaking the rules. So I think it's a per- I think the rules were insane. They were very difficult to follow. It's OK to be in, in, in an office but not in the garden of that office. It was a whole series of bonkers extreme moves where some people were fined, in my view, illegitimately. And I think we should wake okay. up and smell the coffee. Andrew? Up. This is a man who's got form. He thinks the rules are not for him. You look at his entire career. I mean, he's done it, you know, in sort of matters of state with the, you know, mates of his of his party getting well, massive contracts. Like but that's not enough. He's to done it in his, his personal. Resignation. He's done it his personal you life. Might not like you know, his character. These his, are ad hominem. Well, what? Hang on a sec. Do we have to wait till you and now us to call for his resignation? I mean, who adjudicates when you call for his resignation? Surely it's it shakes down from a breach of the regulations. Well, I think you're. I think, you're perfectly, I think you're perfectly within your rights to call for, for his resignation, but I suspect, Zoe, you would call for his resignation even if these parties hadn't happened. Well, you did would call I? For his re- okay, find an re- example when I did. Because because you've already got a prejudgment on his character. You made a series again, like... like uh, it's just silly. Uh, Come on. No, no, but you, you made a series of character-based arguments about his nature. Now, I don't necessarily think that he has the full talents that you might want from a prime minister but then who does but he does have other talents and i think it's those talents come to the fore in i think two crucial ways for the conservative party he's the first prime minister to break with austerity which i'm profoundly agree with he's the first prime minister to try to set out an agenda to help the working classes of this nation the leveling up a uh, white paper is the first coherent bit of of policy that this government well, no no but now. what i wanted to say is not there coherent. are good reasons to support him the, these would not have happened without that okay. they are mm. of merit Andrew, i'm going to give you the, give you the Ukraine, final word on this so, it's vital okay, for Andrew. the defense of ukraine so six weeks ago there were 50 conservative mps who didn't think he was up to the job and I think that number would have grown were it not for the Ukraine crisis and I just don't think that Ukraine is a sufficient reason to say that this man well, is we might have a question on job. that in a moment but Rishi Sunak has just issued a statement he says I can confirm I have received a fixed penalty notice from the Metropolitan Police with regards to a gathering held on the 19th of June in Downing Street I offer an unreserved apology I understand that for figures in public office the rules must be applied stringently in order to maintain public confidence I respect the decision that has been made and have paid the fine I know people sacrificed a great deal during Covid and they will find the situation upsetting I deeply regret the frustration and anger caused, and I am sorry. Like the Prime Minister, I'm focused on delivering for the British people at this challenging time. Well, we'll get all of your reaction to that uh, in just a few moments' time, and we'll take more of your calls. It's 17 minutes past eight. This is LBC.
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. 90 minutes past eight on LBC. We'll get our panel to comment on the Rishi Sunak statement as part of their answers to the next question because it kind of fits in with it. It's James in Ayrshire. James, very good evening. What would you like to ask? Yeah, hello, Ian. Um, my question is, at a time of national and international crisis, isn't it important that the Prime Minister enjoys the trust of the overwhelming majority of the British people? Well, that's an interesting question because we heard from Chris Curtis from Opinion earlier in the programme who told us their snap poll this afternoon showed that 58% of people want the Prime Minister to resign over this. I have to say I thought it might be a little bit higher than that. Uh, 27% of Conservatives want him to go. Um, but, of course, sometimes in political situations you stick with nurse for fear of worse. And there's... Given that I think we can probably all agree that Rishi Sunak has fallen by the wayside as a potential successor, at least in the short term, um, you have to have some credible alternatives. So, but James's question, is it not appropriate to change the PM in a time of crisis to someone who we can trust more? Who would that be, Zoe Williams? I mean, I think we need a change of government. I don't want to just be it's shaking the dregs of the Conservative Party until we get to somebody who's halfway honest. I don't know who that would be. Um, you know, I could name, I could, I could guess at an honest Conservative. Well, who would be the Guardian choice? Uh, now, well, now, that, now that Rory Stewart the, isn't there. Everybody how... knows who the Guardian... I mean, you're talking kind of fantasy Conservative League, Yeah, right? go on then. So you'd want Ken Clark to come back from retirement... Well, he's in the Lords, so that's not going to happen. ...and also be younger, like current 20 MP, years current younger. MP. You'd want Rory Stewart to be an MP. He's not. I mean, Amber, you know, there, there, there are people, well, there are people in, my, in my orbit who find Jeremy Hunt unobjectionable. I am not one of those people. <laughs> um, look, for God's sake, we need a general election. It's a, this is a disaster. It's a terrible thing. you're not going to get and one, And everybody you? knows it. No, but I'm just saying, you know, and, but, you know, failing... I was thinking about what Philip said earlier about an amnesty on fines, because actually you can call for Boris's John Boris Johnson's resignation, and I think he should proffer it, but I don't think he's going to. And I'm not sure what it was strategically it would help the left or the opposition. But if you were going to, if you were going to refine... With the outrage people feel into a demand, it would be to not just an amnesty on fines. People should have their fines paid back. Yep. And if the if the government Absolutely. can't afford it, then Rishi Sunak should pay it. We have he won't unanimity even between with Philip and Zoe. Yeah, here, I, I think, which I think is it's outrageous well. that people were fined what they were. Absolutely outrageous. Yeah, 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 but it's really serious amounts of money for a lot of people, especially people who've got I compound agree. fines, and and they should just be paid back. It's ridiculous. It's immoral. Um, I agree. Um, Alan, when when you look at the those polling figures, mm. is it not important for the country to have a leader that they can trust in a time of international crisis? Not domestic political crisis, but international crisis. Well, I think that if you were to ask that question about the con you know the conduct of the war in Ukraine, I think you'll find a lot of people would actually go on the we trust Boris on that side, which is quite ironic. So the questioner has raised an interesting point, but I think actually on an international crisis point, there are very few people who would critique Boris on that point. Certainly Keir Starmer's not critiquing him, other party leaders not critiquing him, on the conduct of the war in Ukraine and Britain's position. I think that says something for him in this, posi in this moment, which is that actually... Um, it may well be the case that people don't trust him on um, his breaking of coronavirus rules. But I think on this question, it plays very much to his strengths. He is the kind of leader who has um, shone in this kind of conflict. And I have to take issue with what Zoe said earlier about what, what uh, President Zelensky might think. I, I don't believe for a minute President Zelensky is secretly going, oh, I wish you'd do more for the refugees. I think he wants arms now, he wants help now, he's desperate to save his country from the coming onslaught, and this onslaught is going to be brutal. The Russians are concentrating their force... I think he also does care force. about his refugees, though. The, the Russians are concentrating their force on the east of the country, and the Ukraine needs all the defence assistance it can get, which means better weapons than before. That much is evident. Now, Boris is leading the world on that score. There are others joining, but the, he's, lead, he's led from day one on that, he's stuck his chin out, he's made himself felt on that subject, and I think on this question, I think the country is absolutely behind him. Let, let, let's bring in David in Victoria here because his question is kind of allied to this as well. David, go ahead. OK. First of all, who's going to replace Boris Johnson? And it's all very well the Conservatives replacing their leader, but doesn't there should be a general election soon after that, within, within say, four or six months? Is that a good idea? Andrew. 
well, I think it's a good idea because I want to get rid of this Conservative government. But I fear that the long, the more deep in crisis they are, whether Boris Johnson's the Prime Minister or someone else, the longer this Parliament will go on. And I think we won't see an election till 2024. We'll just see continuing chaos. Yeah. And, and there's and another disunity. reason for that, because the boundary changes don't come in until November 2023. The boundary 2023. changes give the equivalent of an extra 10 seats mm. to the, the Conservatives defending. I mean, the point about Boris Johnson's premiership has been disunity. He came in as the candidate of one side of a riven country. Yeah, yeah. He has always been as Prime Minister, a man who is not there to bring the country together, who doesn't try to bring the country together, but to pit one side against the other. It's only the Labour Party who are doing the very difficult job of trying to build bridges and bring people who have been massively divided by everything that's happened over the last decade, but Brexit in particular, trying to bring people together and have a bit of respect, even if you don't agree with um, each other. Boris Johnson's not interested in that. He just wants his... You know, he's just enough numbers to get his votes, and he will be happy with that. Um, and I think it will fail for him. I think he will lose the next election, uh, having prosecuted this divisive, nasty form of politics. It's actually quite difficult for the Labour Party to win the election, though, isn't it, given the electoral <laughs> arithmetic? By current form, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but if you look at the fact that it's unlikely that they would gain many seats in Scotland, so it's quite difficult to see how they would get a majority government. I can imagine a minority government. Um, Philip, back to the questions. Um... I think that we we do need elections at their proper time, and I, th I suspect Boris will win again because what I think you're right about domestically policy is in a mess, and it's in a mess because the Conservative Party has realigned around the votes of working class people, but it hasn't developed the policies to serve working class people. Agreed. That's genuinely, I think, where we are. And the best hope for that, I think, is Boris Johnson. I think he genuinely wants to deliver on that. All the alternatives to Boris Johnson are, are 1980s extreme austerity-driven Thatcherites who will do many things, but they will not serve the British working class. And so, so that's, for me, that's the goal, is getting a domestic policy... Uh, kind of offer in place and we don't have the parliamentary party for it we don't have the ministers for it but what Boris does is he at least offers a vision and a hope to deliver on that and I believe in that what I think he has done and I, do, I agree with kind of he's not a perfect liberal prime minister who the upper middle classes are comfortable with because he serves them he, he's got a different set of talents and you know what in this extreme situation with Ukraine where you've got Russians coming in, targeting women and children, killing them on purpose, mass killing. Who would have guessed it that he's flowered and delivered something unique? And what Zelensky... And, and I think that is valuable to the West as a whole, not just this country. And I think that if he can, if he can win the war abroad... I hope he can win the war at home. And, well, if, and, and if, I think that is the basis of his support. If the Tories did get rid of him, and mm. there's still a possibility that that could yeah. happen, he, despite the fact that uh, several MPs who had sent in letters have said today they've yeah. w withdrawn them, I want each of you to give me your nomination as to who you think is most likely to succeed Boris Johnson if it was, say, in the next six months. Philip, I think Liz Truss would be the most likely. Andrew? Quite likely, but maybe an outsider from not in cabinet, Jeremy Hunt. Sorry? I think probably Liz Truss, although she's making an absolute idiot of herself. I think Liz Truss had a very good recent period, actually, and I think she is now, now that Rishi Sunak's imploded, I think she is in oh pole gosh, position. Have you not seen that awful photo where she drapes a kind of background of rubbish with a blanket and then sits trying to look I think, mm. I think look, I think if you, if, you, <laughs> if, you, if you were being serious, Liz Truss does not have a domestic policy offer to serve the British working class. That's not what I mean. Sorry, sorry, okay, sorry. So I just, I just need to pick up, Philip, because you keep saying all these things you believe. You know, you believe the Prime Minister when he speaks to you. You believe he's got an offer for the working class. You believe levelling up is working even though nothing has happened. I didn't say yeah. working. You believe, the you believe the policy good. is sincere and not just a vote spinning nonsense. You believe all these things for which there's absolutely no evidence. And I know you're a theologian by trade, but when are you going to base your 
your analysis in reality. Well, I appreciate mm. I, I appreciate your journalist, but you really should read, and you should read the levelling up white paper. Yeah, I have read it. I mean, it's got copy, copy and paste job off it's, Wikipedia. It's not, actually, repeat all, all, all of the genuine received opinion in it think it's the finest bit of work on British economic development since the Second no, World War. That's genuinely War. not true. It, it that's is genuinely, genuely not true. true. Oh, look, I know the people criti- work the, in the, the department, the, Philip. That's the, genuinely the not criticism, true. The criticism... Because it says... Because it says a number of complex things. It says there isn't one single magic bullet. There are a variety of factors and it names them. And it creates a mission statement around delivering on that. Where it lacks is it doesn't give us the priorities and it doesn't give us the money. That's well, exactly. I the Treasury won't that. even take their calls. I, know, I because, mean, it's a trivial piece yeah, of but work. Yeah, but that's an ignorant statement, It's I'm not. Afraid. It really Philip, is. Why are you assuming that I can't read? Why are you assuming because, that I don't read? Because I'm but why are you assuming that I don't know? Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, yeah, we need to make a slightly different point here. No, one point. <laughs> styles of leadership, okay? Boris has a certain style of leadership. It's a visionary leadership. That's what he does. He's not a detailed person. We all understand that. You saw when he was mayor of London, it was a vision thing. When he won the 2019 election, it was a vision thing. Why he's good in Ukraine is because it's a vision thing. That's his style of leadership. Now, that works well in certain circumstances. It doesn't work well in other circumstances. We just have to accept and recognise it. He's the leader Uh, presiding presiding over this government. You have to judge it on its deeds. Mm -hmm. Look what they did last week to the living standards of ordinary working families, working class families, Philip. Point. They, they, they have just, point. with inflation soaring, they've raised taxes, they've done nothing on bills, and they have cut benefits. And, you know, they could Andrew have done this, something. Is right. Okay, I and did that's say the, because we have, I did say the last word. Yeah. Hang on, but hang on. Why, no, 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 I did say the last word was going to Andrew. Actually, it's going to Chris in Brecon, <laughs> who says Penny Mordant will be the next oh. Tory leader. Wow. If I was a betting person, I think a, a swift fiver on somebody like her might not be wasted. Did you, you make you anything on the national, though? No, because I don't bet. Oh, and I think I made that, quite and a lot. I, and I think the, gra- and <laughs> I, and I, and I no, think the grand the national. And the oh, I think well, the grand right, national yeah. should be banned for animal cruelty okay, reasons so that's as well. Fair. Uh, on that controversial bombshell, uh, let's get the latest news headlines on LBC. It's 8.31. Here's Simon English. Boris Johnson says he humbly accepts he was in breach of coronavirus lockdown rules after becoming the first sitting Prime Minister to be punished for breaking the law. He says he understands the anger many people may feel but isn't resigning. Mr Johnson has confirmed he's paid a fixed penalty notice for being at what he calls a brief gathering on his birthday in June 2020. The Chancellor has also apologised unreservedly after being fined. Three women have received financial damages for more than two decades after being abused by grooming gangs in Rochdale. Nine men were convicted in 2012, but Greater Manchester Police is now apologising. And some breaking news, Ukraine says it has detained a pro-Russian opposition leader in the country. The fugitive oligarch Viktor Medvedchuk is a close ally of Vladimir Putin. LBC weather, rain continuing to push northwards across Scotland tonight, drier further south, a mixture of sunny spells and showers tomorrow, and a high of 18 degrees. This is LBC.
Ask Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 8.35 on LBC. We've been enjoying your comments on the panel on text and uh, Twitter. Uh, Jilly says, could you please dissuade the panel from all speaking over each other at the same time? It's an incoherent gabble. I've done my best, but sometimes sort of passions rise and, you know. Anyway, let me remind you who's on the panel in case you've just tuned in. Philip Blonde is former advisor to David Cameron, director of the Respublica Think Tank. Andrew Harrop is general secretary of the Fabian Society. Zoe Williams is columnist for The Guardian and Alan Mendoza, executive director of the Henry Jackson Society. Let's go to Kirsty in Gurach in Scotland. Hello, Kirsty. Hello, hi. I've spoke to you before. Um, I just want to. I, the more I think I've spoke to you before, and I think you were in agreement with me before. This is Goodness me. ridiculous now. It's absolutely ridiculous now. Why do we have a system where we allow people to lie? Why have we not? Can we not change? Can we not? Can they not go and do a total clear out and get away from this Victorian thing of um, be- believing that oh somebody uh, you're going to have good integrity to be a, a a prime minister when he's got no integrity he will not resign how is it that he can lie and lie and lie get found out all the time and then the person I don't know what the guy's name is that says that he's doing a wonderful job in recruiting. Oh, my God, he's the laughing stock of the world. Putin must be laughing, must be rubbing his hands. He must be saying, well, this guy's a liar. He does this, he does what he wants. And, I mean, what system do we have? I mean, I feel like I'm living in... Well, we have a system where we have a general election. Yes, but I know, but this guy has been found guilty. Like, I'm a nurse, right? If I did went against my protocols of what I have to do. I would have, would have been, like, if I, for instance, I had to wear full gown, full everything, in uh, looking after a, a, a mother, um, babies that the mothers had COVID, right? I had to wear that for 13 hours, these masks. It was horrendous. And I can assure you there was some time okay. where I couldn't breathe. Kirsty, I, I need, I need you to job, ask your question. Okay, my question is, why do we have a system that allows this man to lie and not okay. get so, not get sorted out? Why is he still in, in position when he's okay. he knows lies? All right, thank you very much. Uh, Andrew Harrop, effectively, Kirsty's saying, look, the, the system has broken down. We can't get rid of him. There ought to be a system to get rid of somebody who, she says, lies constantly. I think it's a fair point. Um, The sort of sense of democratic checks and balances uh, that you'd want to have around a failing, lying government just have been whittled away. But also something that's not about laws and processes, but it's about culture and values. In the past, the Conservative Party would have dealt with a man like Boris Johnson you know, all the sort of the, the the secret quiet conversations would have kicked in. They seem to be either they're Hardly terrified democratic, of him. Though, is it? Well, it's what has always happened in the past. It it, it now feels that they're terrified of the man. Next or they see be saying new leaders should emerge rather than be voted for. Look, <laughs> Boris Johnson is, is Fabian's voice. Is the fir- <laughs> Boris Johnson is the first is the first prime minister who's ever been found guilty of a crime while in office. He's a serial liar. Um, you know, I I wish that politicians of his own party would do something about it. Philip. Look, I think Johnson has vices and and he has virtues. And the British public were well aware of his nature when they voted for him. Well aware. I don't think that he's suddenly done a volt fast um, um, after he was elected. So the interesting question is why did the vast majority uh, why, how did he obtain that vast majority? And that's because people saw past what they viewed as not important to something they did view as important, which is somebody who might construct a vision that's different from what has gone before. Now, has that vision been fulfilled? No, I agree with you. And I also agree with what Zoe said. Just, the domestic offer is highly dysfunctional, but people thought he might deliver on it. And that's why they voted for him. So what I would like to see him do is deliver on it. What I'm saying is actually, I can't think of a better leader 
in in the international crisis of the West than Johnson is performing now. Unexpectedly, he's genuinely delivering something that no other Western but, but going leader back to, has. Going back to the question, should yeah. there be a different way of removing a prime minister for whatever reason? Yeah, it's called democracy, and so far he's winning it. Sorry. It's interesting because I, I do share Kirsty's frustration. You, you know, you can watch these situations unfold and unfold and unfold and you think that this can't carry on. I mean, I felt like that about Theresa May, even though I didn't think there was anything wrong with her personally. I just felt like we were kind of, it was such, it was so ramshackle and it was, and it, and it was, you know, nobody had a, nobody had any idea how to solve it and it was just kind of lurching from one failed vote to another. And it looks for ages like you haven't got any democratic agency because you haven't. Um, but then as soon as it starts to fall, it falls really, really fast. But just, the, the difference is that, you know, as a, as a subject, as a citizen, you don't have any say in that until the, until the general election, whereupon the conditions that have been created by the collapse sometimes bite you in a way that you, there's not a lot you can do about. So, so Sorry, that, that was a really long way of saying, Kirsty, I really share your frustration. But I haven't got a suggestion as to how it could be brought about. Well, about. no, but I mean, you, you know, it, it, like so many things, since Boris Johnson has been as prominent as he has, and certainly since he's been prime, prime minister, and, and the system did rely on a lot of tacit understandings, you know, that if somebody broke the ministerial code, they resigned, that if somebody, did, you know, you wouldn't prorogue Parliament when there was an important vote, that you wouldn't do these things, that you wouldn't say something to the Queen, which could in any way be considered misleading. There were kind of understandings of kind of honour and co in conduct which the, which this lot don't observe. Um, and it, it's not going to be over till it's over for them. They're not okay. going to be embarrassed into resigning. Alan? Well, I'm old enough to remember another Prime Minister who was accused by many people of lying. Millions of people came out in the streets to protest against his policy about a lie. Tony Blair, I'm talking about. Tony Blair didn't resign over the Iraq War. He won an election in the middle of the Iraq War. Democracy did what it did, even in even through this, OK? Um, so, in reality, we have to let democracy work itself out. The people will ultimately decide what they feel about Boris Johnson and whether they feel he has lied or hasn't lied or whether they feel that's sufficient. Or, as Philip said, if there are other factors that mean that... Even if he has lied, they're prepared to keep him in office. And I think I mean, we've got to trust that, the people. There is the vaguest of possibilities, very vague, that he could say, OK, look, I recognise that a lot of people think I've done wrong here. Let's have an election and I'm going to put myself to the, to the vote again. I mean, w that would be an interesting way of solving this, wouldn't it? It would be a bit like um, Gordon Brown's honeymoon election. That everybody said he should he should call, and he well, he was too scared, and, and he would he should have called that honeymoon mm. election because people still liked him. I mean, I think if, if Boris Johnson were to say, that as a sign of gigantic penitence, I'm going to put this matter back in your hands, I think he'd be in a stronger position than if he waits till 2024, is forced to hold a general election, and everybody's got the kind of sick taste in their mouth of a man who behaves without without honour and, and never never really apologises. A for friend it. of mine who works in Downing Street texted me earlier and say, "So, what do you reckon?" I think I'm going to come up with that that argument. Say, so let's have an election because I love elections. But I actually don't want an election. I, I, you know, the Labour Party needs. They, they need a bit more time. Oh, here we go, here we go. This is another Jeremy Corbyn. Yes, we must have an election. Oh, no, suddenly we don't want one, no, isn't no, it? No, that was nothing, that was, that, was not, that was not my line then, although it was Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> I, I don't actually agree with Zoe. I think Labour would do fine if there's an election right now. Um, you know, they're well ahead in the polls and this government's in, in disarray. Um, what happens over the next two years is... You know, it could get worse and worse and worse for the Conservatives. They could look back at this moment and see, you know, it was the start of a slippery slide. But unfortunately, politics is fickle, and it could be that in a year and a half's time, this all feels like ancient history. Yeah. Well, um, we'll have you back in a year and a half's time and see uh, what the situation is then, because, uh, as I said earlier in the programme, a, a week isn't a long time in politics. Now a day is a long time in politics. Um, Kirsty, what do you make of what you've heard? I just think that I'm living in the dark ages in France when we needed a revolution because the people in power are just in power and we can't get rid of them. The whole of Scotland didn't vote for Johnson, but he, we've got him as a, as, yeah. as a prime minister. I tell you what, if he came up here, he'd probably be lynched. I'm sorry, I think it's a disgrace. I think it's an absolute disgrace. And I think so, I'm embarrassed. Britain, to me, I'm an emba it's an embarrassment. Absolute embarrassment. So, so can I can I take it, Kirsty, that when I do my Edinburgh Fringe show in August, <laughs> I shouldn't invite Boris Johnson to be a guest on it because it might not go down yeah, very well. I, I, well, I tell you what, he, he he doesn't come up to Scotland now, and he came up for 
flick, flippant little visits. I'm telling you now, he is hated here. And the more he is in power, the further and further away Scotland is going to go. You're going to lose Scotland with Johnson. And if you guys don't wake up, I'm telling you, you guys are going to lose Scotland <laughs> because we don't like... Scots do not like elitism. We do not like the powers that be doing what they want to do and the rest of us suffering. Why is it that this one guy there said they're okay. leveling up? You know what I mean? I'm going to be paying more taxes and in, in, uh, in um, what's it? In, um, national health contribution. National insurance. Okay, yeah. Kirsty, thank you, thank you very much. Quick word from you, Alan. Well, I just want to hear from Kirsty. How does she vote in the referendum? She's gone. Oh, oh yes. no, she's back. I, 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 yes, I'm a yes voter. And now I can assure you, you'll never get me back for the union, oh, ever. Not with this lot, never. OK, I think, I think we got the message there, mm-hmm. Kirsty. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> we'll take more of your calls in just a moment. 0345 6060 973. It's quarter to nine. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. People closing down refineries, making it impossible in some instances for ambulances to refuel. And they're saying we have to do this because there'll be no ambulances on a dead planet. Just look at what the gay rights campaigners have achieved and the trans campaigners have achieved. And they've never closed a bridge. They've never closed a petrol station. They've never bolted themselves to the goalposts of a football match. None of the above. All you're doing by closing down petrol stations and bringing about a mini fuel skip is hardening people against you. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player. LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. It's getting very raucous in this studio. We have Philip Blonde, Andrew Harrop, Zoe Williams and Alan Mendoza with us sometimes in breaks. It's like nobody talks to each other, but this has been very different. Right, let's go to the next question. It's Jackie in Cheltenham. Hello, Jackie. Oh, it's a text, sorry. Um, my fault. Why? What should the consequences be if Russia has used chemical weapons in Ukraine? Alan. 
The first thing, of course, is we don't know if they've used chemical weapons in Ukraine. It's very important to state that. Um, there has to be a proper investigation. Um, there have been some Ukrainian sources today I, you know, that I've seen that have downplayed the idea this actually happened. They're, it's very unclear what happened in Mariupol and whether this was going on. I think, of course, if it was deduced that they have done, I mean, firstly, we haven't, of course, exhausted the whole sanctions line. There's plenty of other sanctions we still be putting on. I mean, I'm a bit baffled why we haven't, to be honest, at this point in time. But I would hope that a suit response at that point would be to say, look, screw this sort of sitting back and not supplying the Ukrainians with all the kit they need. We are, you're using chemical weapons? Fine. Here are aircraft, here are tanks, here are artillery pieces, go do your worst. I don't think the Russians would have a leg to stand on in defence. I don't think they'd react either. Well, they could react by pressing a nuclear button. No, they won't. They won't do that. Putin is rational, ultimately. I don't buy this nonsense that Putin is a madman who... I think he miscalculated. I think he was fed nonsense. He believed the nonsense of propaganda. I think he made a mistake. I don't believe for one minute that he's going to launch a nuclear strike against P the West. Putin's not a suicide bomber. He sits 60 foot away from anybody in case he catches COVID or they try to assassinate him. The disaster of the West, which primarily, I think, is in the White House, is we took everything off the table at the beginning and we gave carte blanche to the Russian to intervene without penalty. And in large part, I think, we're responsible for much of the carnage and the murder and the killing of children and women and men and civilians because we took our lead from the, the US president and we basically said, it'll be over in 48 hours, we're not going to do anything. So they just went right in, carte blanche. And now we're in a painful process of trying to put things back onto the table and it's it's a bit too late but do you, do, do, hang, hang on, do, do you agree with alan though about um what we should do now if they, uh, if they have used chemical weapons yeah well i think we could even do more we could establish uh a, we could go into western ukraine without attacking them and establish a safe zone in ukraine we could establish a humanitarian uh, corridor enforced by us out of Mariupol because they're killing people by artillery um, and they're going house to house shooting civilians. None of this would provide... Uh, we, we've essentially played this game very badly. We've accepted Putin's nuclear intimidation. He just said, I'll use nuclear weapons. We went, oh, OK, wrong. Took everything off the table and gave him carte blanche. In, in what sense? Can you just flesh out a bit exactly mm. what the Americans... You know, there, was, there were things that it was assumed were off the table, such as military retaliation. With, you, you know, that was assumed to be off the table because it wasn't a member of NATO that had been attacked. But what did the, what did Biden expressly take off the table? I think and he took everything off the table. He basically mm. said, "You can you can intervene with in Ukraine with impunity." He did say it's if it was a minor backyard. incursion, well, that's one thing. If you it's know. a major one, it's another one. Which <laughs> and, and when, when you combine that with the fact that he was yeah. vice president when Obama's red line well, yeah, was yeah, crossed yeah, yeah. in no, Syria, I, I think, and, and there I was think no that, reaction to the annexation of well, Crimea, you can see how Putin might have come to that. Well, I think I think Syria is probably an instructive lesson in terms of chemical weapons, right? Because that is the time when chemical weapons were used. And, and we Obama said that it was a red line, but his red line didn't seem to convey anything. Mm. There, was not, there was nothing on the other side of the red line. Mm. But I, I don't think I would trace a direct through line from that to Biden's definite stance on anything. Because no, but, no, but on this, Zoe, Biden has been quite explicit about things that he will not accept. He will not say there will be no American troops on the ground. He's been quite yeah, explicit yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. He has those things he's been taken off. In fact, just this week, I was having a conversation with someone fairly close to him uh, who said, if I had to critique Biden's policy, it's that he's been very clear about it, what he won't do and less clear about what he will do, and he should have been the other way around. But, mm. then, but then isn't it isn't it taken as given that, that like a kind of conventional warfare with troops on the ground would be would completely out of scope, not just for the US, but also for the EU and for us? Yeah. I'm going to leave that question hanging because we have enough man Andrew Sorry. now. Yeah, well, I think that we've got to remember the, the negatives, the risks. I mean, we don't want a situation where American and Russian forces directly face off each other. That, you know, that way leads, you know, mm, mm, mm. even if it's a 1% chance of a dangerous escalation to a nuclear situation, let's not take that 1% chance. So but Biden may have made mistakes, but, you know, the reason for his caution is well-founded. But I think there are things that can happen now. I mean, for example, Finland and Sweden joining NATO, you know, that would be... Which Putin has warned against this indeed. week. Indeed, you know, you can imagine things which bolster the Western alliance without being over-aggression and creating that situation of risk of American and Russian forces facing off each other. We don't okay. need that. Okay, 
Right, I want to move on to the next question uh, because it's an important one. Robert's in Norwich. Hello, Robert. Hello, Ian. What I'd like to say is Frosby and Telford show that NHS trusts cannot be trusted to investigate perinatal deaths and uh, deaths of mothers during childbirth. Should all investigations into any baby death, of which is about 2,200 a year, be by an independent investigator? Well, that's an interesting idea. Um, I, I sort of almost want to draw an analogy with what happens in the uh, police. Zoe? Well, actually, I don't think the analogy is the same. I think the, the NHS kind of famously, the, the, famously from within it, it's got a really... But it's got a really bad culture around blame and the attribution of blame, and that and that is disastrous for ever finding out what ha what happened because everybody's the, all you find out is who's the best at covering their back and who's the best at finding somebody else to blame. But if you drill into this, this has been a real going concern since you know since the early noughties, so before mm. the austerity, but certainly compounded by it. The NHS was paying so much in um, compensation. And, the, and people were trying to figure out why they were paying so much in compensation, especially around obstetric care. And the reason was that there weren't there weren't consultants available at weekends. And so you were getting a huge amount of births that really went disastrously wrong because there weren't the right people present at them. And the reason at the time was was because it was a bit dicey, you know. You didn't find that you didn't have any cardiac surgeons around at weekends. It was just this kind of given. You've got there was a there was a kind of underfunding of maternity and female care generally. Now the Conservatives came in and rather than maybe addressing that, they underfunded everything. So at least you can say they brought us equality. But <laughs> the truth is, um they what they, they the, the less you fund it, the more mistakes are made because the fewer consultants it's, are it, deployed it, and the more you have to pay in compensation. So it's a false economy, but it does have a material difference. So whether or not that means it should be an independent panel, look, if you want an independent panel to tell us that the NHS is underfunded, f fill your boots, but I wouldn't. Andrew? I think it's really important that uh, organisations own and investigate their own mistakes, and um, there's obviously a handoff point where things become so serious that someone from outside should be called in. But you know, at what a point? chief executive because of a trust it, it, should call someone in yeah. rather than being... But you if know, you're chief executive of a trust, you inevitably are protecting your own back. Yeah, that's because the culture is so wrong. I mean, they, they often say... Natural human the worst, yeah, the worst people to get this, you know, sort of, you know, hero surgeons who are seen as, you know, God by the staff around them and no one can ever challenge. You've got to have a, a culture where everyone is constantly questioning and challenging mm. each other. Philip? The trouble with the NHS is nobody knows who's responsible for what. You have a multiplicity of, of agencies and centres, all of which fight for control, all of which can balkanise and declare independence. Nobody's in control. It's a completely dysfunctional managerial system. It's not just the money. And I think... I think kind of one of the things that was good about Jeremy Hunt's tenure is he was about patient safety. And you have had scandal after scandal with with the 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 unnecessary deaths of hundreds of, of people in different areas. I remember the Morecambe Bay scandal. And it goes on and on because we, we have a dysfunctional structure within which it's impossible to attribute and find responsibility. Alan. They bang on the table. But I will, look, I'll say this. I think the NHS is a massive bureaucracy, as we know. And the way that this plays itself out is always going to be difficult internally to come to any conclusion because I think you know, that there's sense in what you say, Philip, uh, in that you never quite know who is responsible for which bit of which activity. And often you will have multiple departments owning the same sort of end result. So I do think on this it's difficult for the NHS to mark its own homework. Um, you would hope... Andrew's right, you would hope there would be this, you know, this ability to create a culture. But given the scale of the bureaucracy, the massive nature of the NHS, its huge size, it's just not viable. And therefore, at times, you have to, when you have a system like this, a situation like this, which is so manifestly wrong, you've got to bring in some outside help, at least some help, to go and help with that investigation. Right, quick one-word answer to this question, please, yes or no. Dean in Hartlepool wants to know, should Crispin Blunt MP lose the Conservative whip for his statement defending Imran Khan MP. He's the person who was found guilty of sexually molesting a 15-year-old uh, this week. Alan? If he can't explain why he said it, then the answer is yes. Sorry? I think he's going through a thing and he's going to end up recusing himself for taking the hundreds or something. Yes, I think it should be a by-election. Um, and Philip? Yes. Well, 
Nearly one word answers from all of you. Uh, final question from Diane in Carlisle. It appears that the PM was ambushed by cake on his birthday, as Connor Burns suggested. If you could be ambushed by any kind of cake, what would it be? So, Zoe. <laughs> well, thank you for asking, Diane. I'm actually going to make a cherry and almond cake this weekend, so that one. Save me a slice. I will. Alan? Do you know what? Now that you've mentioned cherry and almond cake, I was thinking of uh, a chocolate cake, but actually, I want the cherry and almond cake. <laughs> there, there, so. Cakeism is alive and well in this studio. Andrew? Well, if it's an ambush, it probably has to be a custard pie in your face. <laughs> you won't be invited back. <laughs> Philip? Coffee and walnut. Oof. Every <laughs> oh, oh, delicious. Eccles cake. Um, thank you all very much indeed. Philip, Andrew, Zoe and Alan, uh, we will have you all back at some point in the not-too-distant future. Well, in the next hour, uh, we've cleared the board, but I do want to hear more of your reaction to the news today that Boris Johnson has received a fixed penalty notice. What should happen now, do you think? Do you think it's a little bit exaggerated, these calls for him to resign, or do you think, no, he's broken the law, he's broken the ministerial council, code that is the only way out for the conservative party here to get a new leader you're listening to lbc i'm ian dale it's nine o'clock on your radio on global player and play lbc leading britain's conversation this is lbc From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock, the Prime Minister has rejected calls to resign after being fined for breaking lockdown rules. Boris Johnson has confirmed he's paid the fixed penalty notice followed following a gathering in Downing Street on his birthday in June 2020. He says his colleagues offered well wishes for no more than ten minutes. In all frankness, at that time, it did not occur to me 